This is Abud. He lives in the West Bank, a region of the Holy Land at the center of the Israel-Palestine conflict. Despite his Arabic first name, Abud is not Palestinian. And although his surname Cohen comes from the Hebrew for priest, nor is he Jewish. Abud Cohen is a Samaritan, possibly one of the last of the Samaritans. With such a small population, the tribe must find a way to increase their numbers if they are to survive the next hundred years, let alone 3,000. My name is Leon McCarran, and I'm a bit of an explorer. For the last decade, I've been traveling around the world slowly, often on foot. Here, in the heart of the Middle East, the Holy Land is one of the most complex places on Earth, but it is also one of the most fascinating. Behind me in here is the city of Nablus and the mountain of Gerizim. A few years ago, I was walking through this region and I heard the story of the ancient Israelite Samaritans living on top of that mountain. Many of us will know the name Samaritan from the Good Samaritan, the well-known Christian parable, the man who helped out a person who was in difficulties. But today, Samaritans are facing extreme difficulties themselves, a population crisis. Once, there was over a million of them, but today, there's barely 800. This ancient tribe has had to resort to the most modern of methods to stave off disaster. The internet, women brought in from Eastern Europe, and a lifting of the ancient prohibition on outsiders and intermarriage. These laws date back before Islam, before Christianity, before Judaism. As this tribe, the Israelite Samaritans, claim to be the oldest religion in the world. They consider themselves the guardians of the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, preserving what they see as the true Israelite traditions. They do not call themselves the Samaritans. They are the Shomronim, or the Keepers. The most holy and sacred place in the Samaritan faith is here, Mount Gerizim. Samaritans believe that Adam and Eve were expelled here from the Garden of Eden. Some believe it was from here that Noah's Ark escaped the floods. And this unassuming spot on the mountainside, perhaps the most significant in the Samaritan faith, is where Abraham came to sacrifice his son Isaac to God. I've come here to the top of Mount Gerizim and it's a really spectacular place. There's the odd burst of gunfire, so you remember exactly where you are in the world. Down below is the Palestinian city of Nablus and you can probably hear the kind of hustle and bustle. We also have the valley here with the Jordan River running through it. And on the far side, the mountains of the country of Jordan and the city of Amman. We've got Jerusalem and Ramallah this way. Uh, the Mediterranean Ocean and Tel Aviv is just about visible on the horizon. And then there's the Samaritan town or village itself of Kiryat Luza just below us. Benny. Hello, Leo. Benny Sadaka is the leading scholar on Samaritan history and has written over a hundred books on the faith. This is, of course, uh, Mount Gerizim, our holy mountain. And it is written in the Torah that this is the chosen place. You have to offer the blessing on Mount Gerizim and to uh, visit the mountain three times a year. This mountain is so entwined in their beliefs that it is no surprise many Samaritans have settled here. Behind me is the new Samaritan neighborhood, Kiryat Loza, that started to be populated in the late 80s. With the backdrop of the Palestinian uprising against Israeli occupation in the 1980s, many Samaritans decided to move to the relative safety of their holy mountain. 
By 1998, all the Samaritans of Nablus had relocated here to Kiryat Luza. The village is home to almost half of the remaining Samaritan population. The others live about 50 kilometers southwest of here. Within hours of my arrival in town, I was summoned to meet one of the community's most important figures. I am the high priest of the Samaritan. We are the oldest people in the world. All the world. Are there ever any difficulties with the Samaritans? You're right in the middle of this really complex space and you have to live amongst Israelis and Palestinians. And certainly from the outside, it seems like a, it's very hard to see how a solution might be found between Israelis and Palestinians. Is there a way that Samaritans can help with that? We want to be the bridge of peace between Palestinians and Israelis. We took that policy of walking between the political raindrops. Let's say that we became the most political entity in the world because we have to calculate our step every day how to live in peace with the two entities. Despite their peaceful political position, Avoiding the conflict completely in this volatile region is near impossible for the Samaritans. They are unique in that they're the only people allowed to carry two forms of ID, both Israeli and Palestinian. But that can be tricky, as Abud Cohen once found out. We're here in a part of the world that a lot of people think is very dangerous, and they associate it with conflict and with real-life gun battles. Do you ever find that in your own life there's you've had encounters like that well i can tell you that the first time uh, someone pointed the gun at me i was coming for example from a driving lesson one time and there's basically two ways to come back home mm -hmm. one is uh, israeli only and one is uh, a palestinian only road so anyway i just called my father and i told him if he can pick me up basically from the israeli only road Anyway, I go out of the car, it was really dark, and suddenly I saw two, two, two soldiers running at me. And one of them was screaming like, there's no tomorrow. He came up really close to me, pointing the gun at me and shouting. Wow. And it was a really scary moment, especially because you feel like your life is basically in uh, his uh, hands, right? Mm -hmm. So I told him, relax, I'm a Samaritan. He asked for my IDs. I pulled out the IDs and I only had the Palestinian one. Mm. Apparently, I, I forgot the Israeli one at home. And uh, so I, I just like, I, I thought I was in trouble a little bit because, you know, I, how can I convince him I'm allowed to be here? Yeah. And then I remembered my name, you know. I, it's in the ID, it's Abdullah Cohen. My friends call me Abud, but my name is Abdullah. And Abdullah is an Ar really Arabic name, it's a really weird name, but, you know, Cohen is a Jewish family and he was more willing to listen. Yeah, he warned me never to do that again, which I didn't, but. That's a story. That's a terrifying thing to happen to you. Even if you yeah, think you, you can convince you feel like them. your whole life is like in the trigger, you know? So it's not a comfortable yeah. feeling. That's a poetic way of putting it. I stayed with Abud as he prepared for the weekly Sabbath, or Shabbat. Can you tell me about Shabbat? First of all, you're not allowed to work. You're not allowed to study. Suddenly I feel 3,000 years old. It's kind of like going back in time a little bit. You're not allowed to use any car because fire is forbidden and we don't use any kind of electricity. 
Shabbat is personally my favorite day of the week because who doesn't like free vacation, right? And it's a good, a good day to be lazy, you know, maybe. To get to, to be lazy, lazy a little to rest. bit, yeah. It's the beginning of Shabbat, so I'm going to stop asking Abud questions and let him get on with his rest. But I'm also going to sneak in the back and see if I can observe. The Sabbath is the holiest day of the week here and lasts from Sunset Friday till Sunset Saturday. Looking on as these Samaritans worship in the same clothing they have worn since ancient times, I really do feel transported back in time. These prayers mark the beginning of Sabbath. The men will return in the middle of the night for the next prayers, again at midday and finally at sundown Saturday for the closing prayers. The most challenging thing is getting up at 3 a.m. in the morning to the prayer. When you wake up the first second, you're like, oh, I'm just so tired. So can I, I must, must like sleep maybe 10 more minutes so I feel better. Yeah. But at the same time, you think if you slept, there's nothing that's gonna wake you up because there's no wash, there's no snooze. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, I, I told myself, hey, my grandfather woke up and he went, he's 82 years old. And he went with all this rain and all this cold. Come on, man, I have to do it too. Yeah, that's a good way to think about it. Yeah. I guess you've just finished Shabbat. We've now got electricity and lights and beer. How do you feel? Do you feel refreshed or how would you describe your feeling? Well, I have to say something, uh, Leon. I mean, in Shabbat, you do get to a point where I wonder what's happening on, in the world, you know what I mean? Each, each Saturday, we're disconnected from the whole world. So you're, you're not expecting any kind of calls, any kind of emails or text messages. So you kind of have a kind of a calm state of mind, if I have to say it. And this, this is a really good thing. This is a really good thing. I mean, even biologically speaking, your, your body, your eyes are relaxed a little bit. You know, you don't have to focus on any screens and... It's, uh, I, I have to say, it's, a, it's if I wasn't a Samaritan, I would keep Shabbat. <laughs> You're selling the idea to me pretty well at this point. <laughs> I'm tempted. The religious life of a woman in this community comes with its own complications. The Samaritans insist on observing the words of their scriptures to the letter, and the commandments concerning menstruation and purity are still strictly observed. Shirok is a 22-year-old Samaritan woman. She explains how, during their periods, women are kept separate from the rest of the community. There are some people that you cannot speak with in this time. No, obviously. I can speak, but I can't touch them. You can't touch them? And I can't touch uh, uh, the rest of the house, just my things. We have a room for a period. We just enter it uh, when we have a period. We relax, we rest in these seven days, we go away. So uh, we do a lot of things in these seven days. Um, but maybe uh, for um, married uh, women, this will be a little bit, a little bit difficult because they have children. A bigger difficulty faced by the women is that they are by far the minority here. We don't have enough women to marry all men. So in the community there is more, a lot more men than women? Yes. For each girl, three men. Oh really? Wow. So, <laughs> that is quite a big difference. Um, so you have a lot of choice of people to marry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There are fewer than 20 young men and women of Abud's age here in Kiryat Luza. Which means that finding a partner and settling down is far from straightforward. It's a really, really huge topic, marriage. We, we bring it out each weekend, you know, on Shabbat. You uh, discuss those few stories that have been going out between him and her, you know. How many of your friends of your sort of age have found someone already? My age. My age, no one. It's a really important thing, especially if you're a Samaritan. You want to know, are you going to marry a Samaritan or are you going to go outside? 
And if we're going to go outside, it's, this is going to be a totally different route. You know, you don't want to fall in love with a female from outside and in the end, hey, I'm a Samaritan. You have to become a Samaritan to, to marry me. Watch this, watch this. Whoop. There is an urgent need for more women here. With only four main families making up the population, there has been an inevitable narrowing of the gene pool. Potential parents now routinely undergo genetic screening to ensure the health of their offspring. But this step alone is not enough to guarantee the long-term survival of the Samaritans. So now, Samaritan men have been allowed, for the first time, to marry outside the community using the internet and specialised dating agencies to find wives who are willing to join them here. Ala is one such woman, playing her vital part in the Samaritan's answer to their dwindling numbers and gene pool. Crazy, crazy, crazy. How different has life been here from life before in Ukraine? So I would like. There is a lot of work here. 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 In 2010, Ala married Uzi, a Samaritan, and moved to Kiryat Luza. Not only did she have to adapt to a Samaritan culture and religious practices, but she also had to learn the two languages used here, Arabic and Hebrew. Tell me about your husband. How did you meet? אז ראה אולי עשרים בחורה, ולא מצא, כאילו, בלב שלו לא נכנס אף בחורה. פתאום חברה שלי, היא הייתה עובדת במשרד הזה, והיא אמרה, בשבילו יש לי חברה, בואי אני אקרא אותה, וזה נראה לי שמאה אחוז משהו צריך בשבילך. כאילו... לא זוכרת הכל, אבל אני זוכרת שהיה בן אדם יושב וכל הזמן הוא ככה מצחיק, כל הזמן צוחק, ולא יודעת, היה נוח על ידו. Did he come to visit or was this on the internet? לא, הוא בא לאוקראינה. הוא בא, היה שבועיים באוקראינה. And how long did it take for you to decide to come here? יומיים. Two days? Wow, that's quick. Before you met Uzi, had you ever heard of the Samaritans? I didn't know who the Samaritans were. They told me that they were at the beginning, something small, because they were Shomrim Shabbat, but not more. I didn't know where they were and where they were from, until they came to the house. Were your family and friends worried for your safety coming here? Yes, I was afraid. Sometimes it's difficult. נכון, ויש לי ילדים גם, זה מפחיד, אבל מה לעשות, זה חיים, אף אחד לא מכיר איפה יקרה לו. And do you feel that living here on, on the mountain is quite a safe place to be? בו מקום, כאילו, אני גם בעלי כל הזמן אומר לי שמקום הזה אלוהים כל הזמן, כל הזמן שומר על הזה, אז בגלל זה אנחנו בו. While the prospect of moving to such a potentially frightening place and living a completely different life may be daunting, Allah is not alone. It was a really lovely morning to spend with Ella and her kids. And I think there could probably be an impression from the outside that there are these men on top of a mountain who are 
going on the internet and finding brides from the Ukraine and bringing it over, and that it could somehow be seedy or, or not completely above board. But certainly for them, there's a real sense of family there. And my impression is that Ala and Uzi and their family really debunk that. It seems to me that the Samaritans are a strong, well-organized community here, successful keepers of their ancient religion and culture, for the meantime at least. But I still wonder what the future holds for the Samaritans, especially the younger members, like Aboud. As a Samaritan, you know first of all that you're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna go live outside. So the chances are, what I'm getting here is that we probably gonna marry, I'm probably gonna marry a little bit early. So we're talking about maybe 26 even, 25. So personally, I found one. You found one? Yes, uh -huh. she's a Samaritan and we are really, we are really in a great relationship to be oh, honest. Oh wow. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you. We're That's uh, really exciting. three years already. And she is, where does she live? She is in this neighborhood. In this neighborhood? Yes. Wow. You're a dark horse, I've heard oh, yeah. you keep yeah, things, yeah, keep yeah. things quiet. I, you know, I have to plan, man. You have, as a Samaritan, you have to plan. It's a competition, you know, <laughs> survival of the fittest.